Hey guys, Stefan Fischer here from All Off Road. Have a look what I'm wearing, Ineos Grenadier. In this video, I will give you a walkthrough of the Ineos Grenadier and I will tell you what the most other people won't tell you. Can it be a good four-wheel drive? This is my view from a four-wheel driver's perspective. I follow the Ineos Grenadier since the very early days when I read in an article that Sir Jim Redcliffe, one of the richest guys in the UK, wanted to continue building the Defender. After Land Rover announced it would discontinue the Defender as it was in its old shape. That never came to fruition and what does the richest man in the UK do? He decides to build a car from scratch. Well nearly from scratch. He sourced a lot of reliable um, parts like engine, driveline, gearboxes and then built around it his dream four-wheel drive. However, Sir Jim Radcliffe is in the UK and not too much four-wheel driving there beside green landing. So when I had the chance to look at the Great Deer at one of the drive days here in the Glenworth Valley, I jumped on that, went out there and went for a test drive as a passenger. Unfortunately, couldn't drive it myself. So I will have an in-depth look whether the Ineos Grenadier can satisfy my needs for a remote touring vehicle. While there are plenty of journalists who have done already kind of reviews or walkthroughs of the Grenadier, I found that the vast majority are no four-wheel drivers. They seem to have a lot of knowledge about cars, but really they don't four-wheel drive and everything for them with a center diff lock is pretty much uh, the bee's knees and it will drive anything in the world. I obviously see that from a little bit different perspective. As you know, if you follow my channel, I do a lot of four-wheel driving, I do a lot of technical driving, I do a lot of remote touring. So I think I have a pretty good idea what is needed really for a proper four-wheel drive. Let me start with a little overview of the Grenadier and the most relevant specs for four-wheel driving. The Ineos Grenadier will either come with a 3-liter BMW B58 straight 6 turbo petrol or with a 3-liter BMW B57 straight 6 turbo diesel engine. It also has a ZF 8-speed automatic transmission. The dimensions are 115-inch wheelbase. It is 4.9 meters long, 1.93 meters wide and 2.033 meters high. In regards to the approach, departure and ramp over angle, the approach angle is 35.5, the departure angle 31.6 and the ramp over angle is 27.8 degrees. It has solid front and rear axle, a leather frame chassis and progressive coil springs. The car comes with a center diff lock and will have an optional front and rear diff lock. From what I heard, the expected towing capacity will be 3.5 ton and the payload will be one ton, which is both brilliant. I also want to give a big shout out to Tim and the boys from Africa Overland. They also did a good Ineos review and allowed me to use some of their footage. So let's have a closer look at the approach, departure and ramp over angle. If we compare the Grenadier against a few other popular four-wheel drives, you will see that it sits somewhere in the middle in regards to the approach, departure and ramp over angle. However, I feel the Ineos has a lot going on in the front and in the rear. Compare that to my Land Cruiser and forget the 35-inch tires here, just look at the bottom of the diff and then where my last point of contact would be under the rear bar, which is really my extended fuel tank. I feel that the ramp over and departure angle left wanting a little bit, especially with small tires. I think the underbody of the car will have a lot of contact with the terrain if you're driving in ruts, mud, sand or do some technical driving. It's a bit of a pity that South Africa had a Grenadier on 35 inch tires. However, we here in Australia, where 33s and 35s are quite common, only have the stock tires. 
However, the clearances are no deal breaker for me. It's just something to take into consideration and one more reason for me to at least run 33s, but probably better 35s. So I really hope Ineos takes that into consideration and does release a vehicle somewhere in the world on 35s, because that would make engineering here in Australia then much, much easier. So let's have a look around the Ineos Grenadier and underneath. Underneath, everything appears to be quite sturdy. However, it also looks a little bit cramped and chaotic and there are a lot of low hanging parts, including the fuel tank and the rear trailing arm mounts. They really do hang down a lot and I can see you sitting on rocks there reasonably frequently. I want to stress again though, it is an early prototype and I hope Ineos takes feedback on board. Initially, I actually thought the divs are shaved, which would be a nice touch to give better clearance. However, after a closer look, the divs are not shaved, but have additional braces welded underneath. That does add to the strength of the div housing. However, it takes away more div clearance and with the two horizontal braces will not make it easy to slide over obstacles. In my opinion, there needs to be a front to back skid plate, which covers these two horizontal welds. It's good to see though that the car has some solid underbody protection. However, everything does hang pretty low and I can't really see much room to fit a second fuel tank. I do hope that aftermarket companies will come up with a sufficient solution. The front has a five link suspension. However, very short lower control arms. So I'm wondering how the car behaves when you lift it more than two inch. I also noticed that the drive shafts have compound angles which may also be an issue if you lift the vehicle. I think the constant velocity joints on the drive shafts are a good thing. They are easy to replace and they don't get hung up. If we look at the front, it's good to see two recovery points and also a solid bash plate. However, you do see that the low hanging bash plate already had some good contact with the ground and the steering dampener hanging so low is also a concern. The Nears we drove in had sidestep slash rock sliders and again they looked pretty well used given that I haven't seen much really technical driving footage of the Grenadier. It just shows that the rock sliders do have a fair bit contact with the ground even at pretty easy driving due to the ramp over angle. I also have to question the positioning of the rear mufflers behind the rear axle which further decreased the ramp over angle and also take up the space for a likely second or third fuel tank. And while I'm talking about the Ineos Grenadier, please don't forget, give me your comments. Have you been on one of the Ineos tours? Have I missed something? Have you found something which is extraordinary or something which is missing and I haven't noticed? Please let me know in the comment section. So let's now have a look at the interior of the Ineos Grenadier and how it was riding in it. While this is still a prototype and the buttons and so on don't have the final finish, overall I like it, it's very functional, it's easy to operate. The airplane style overhead control panel is a good idea and a nice little touch is that it houses auxiliary switches which are pre-wired so you can easily hook up your accessories. The front and rear seats are very comfortable being Recaro seats and that's why I run Recaros for many years in all of my cars. Even someone my size can sit quite comfortably in the rear with enough leg room. However, it is certainly not a luxury SUV. I'm not a fan of the roof windows as this would be incredibly hot and not practical in Australia, but I hope they are optional. I was quite surprised to see such a big digital display in the Ineos and it provides you far more information than I anticipated. However, I do have a few concerns with that display. I find it quite odd that there is no speedo in front of you and you need to turn your head to see your current speed. For an off-road vehicle I'm also concerned that everything relies on that display and if that display would fail you have no information whatsoever. Incidentally part of the display actually stopped working on the second ride. I would like to see analog gauges for the vital information and maybe a HUD display projected on the windscreen. 
However, there is a small analog display right behind the steering wheel which shows you major warning lights and diff lock operations. One other concern of mine is that the batteries, fuses and so on are all under the rear seat. That is very low and if you ever get caught in a creek crossing and in water that would be the first to flood. So I think it would be good to at least see that encased in the waterproof box. Having the electronics under the rear seat also poses other issues. It means that unlike my Land Cruiser, I can't just take the rear seats out if I, for example, do remote touring by myself. Another thing to consider if you're tall like me is that your eyes are pretty much on level with the top of the window. So the view to the left and right is not that great. However, I'm used to that from a Defender because that is pretty much how the Defender is. I don't mind the double folding barn doors. I think there's a little bit less space than I expected in the rear and uh, these angled um, wheel arch covers, I really hope that is changed because that will make packing and fitting out the rear quite cumbersome and will lose a lot of space. Because of the battery box under the rear seats, you can't fold them down flat and have a leveled area with the cargo floor. One of the many small details and considerations are the lashing points on the rear door. Another neat feature is that you have cargo barrier attachment points after the first seat of rows and the second seat of rows. So that will make it very easy to attach or remove a cargo barrier. To be honest, the drive in the Grenadier wasn't super exciting. Uh, it probably was more exciting that uh, rally legend Tim Bates was my driver. We drove some fire trails in the Glenworth Valley there and yeah, there was nothing challenging, nothing technical, nothing which would show in any way the suspension travel. Um, yeah, it just gave you a reasonably good idea how it would go over bumps. To be honest, I was a bit surprised how harsh uh, the suspension and the ride was. However, supposedly the springs have already the final load rating and given that the car was empty, it's expected to have a bit stiffer ride. Suspension wise, I wasn't overly impressed. However, one of the first modifications to any four wheel drive for me is a lift and high end suspension because that will make a huge difference in the ride quality on road, but even more so off road and over heavy corrugations. The Grenadier supposedly has long travel suspension and progressive springs as well as progressive bump stops. We couldn't evaluate the suspension travel at all on the drive day, but from all the footage I have seen, I think that the suspension travel for a solid axle vehicle is on the lower end. I only had a brief look underneath and especially the rear suspension is hard to see, but my initial impression was that you couldn't easily put much longer shocks underneath, especially in the rear. I did two rounds in the Grenadier. The second time I jumped out at the only section where you possibly could see a little bit the suspension working and that's it. I wish Ineos would have chosen a track where the car could show a little bit its potential and capabilities. Upon request Ineos provided me some stock footage though of the Grenadier in a little bit rougher terrain. Sitting in the back seats I could hear quite a few screeches and rattles. However, this is a prototype, so I would hope that that is solved in the final vehicle. Excellent. Look, design-wise, I don't mind the Grenadier at all. I think it has a very strong resemblance to an old Defender, and I guess that's why they were taken to court uh, by Land Rover. However, Land Rover lost, but I don't think that's a bad thing. So design-wise, I think, yeah, that, that is good. Instead of the Safari windows of the Defender, the Neos has some lashing bars which allow you to tie something on the roof without the need of roof bars or roof rack. The front and rear lights are LEDs, however we could not see how they really performed in bright daylight. On the smaller rear barn door is a ladder to access the roof which comes in handy. Another thing to watch out for is that the spare tire is just mounted to the rear door. That may be fine for a 31 inch tire, but once you go 33, 35, I'm not sure how the door hinges would handle that, especially if you drive over thousands of kilometers of corrugation. 
Another nice little feature are the accessory bars which go all around the car. I can already see aftermarket tables popping up, uh, brush bars and all kind of accessories which you could attach there. I haven't seen any fuel figures released. However, I took this picture here which shows a nearly full tank and a remaining range of 482 kilometers. So I reckon you get around 550 to 600 kilometers out of a tank on road. However, far less obviously in the desert or if you really are off road. So Ineos really needs to come up with a good solution to carry at least double the fuel. Otherwise, uh, it will be nearly impossible to do the canning or Madigan line or any of the remote touring, which for example, I love to do in Australia. A few other bits and pieces. I noticed that the turning circle of the Ineos wasn't that good. I read somewhere it's still around 13 meters, so I hope that will be further improved. The diesel version will only run with the diesel exhaust fluid, which I'm not a big fan of because it adds complexity, another fluid to carry, and it's just another thing to remember. And the last thing I heard that the car will have e-lockers, I just hope they are not uh, Harrop Eaton e-lockers. I've made a dedicated video about them and I certainly would not want them in my car. So guys, this was the walkthrough. Let me know in the comment section whether you think I missed something, uh, good or bad. I quickly want to summarize though. I think the Ineos Grenadier has a lot of good points. However, there are three main concerns I really have and I really want to see how that pans out. Number one, the approach ramp over departure angle is not really that great. That means I definitely would want to run at least 33 inch tires, better 35. So I would like to see whether um, there will be options available to re-gear the diffs for the bigger tires, whether you can adjust the digital odometer um, in regards to the bigger tire size and also what you can do in regards to suspension upgrades. Number two, I have to say, is the biggest letdown and that I don't really understand because if you develop a dedicated four-wheel drive, I think fuel range is something you, you definitely take into consideration and in my book 90 or 95 liters uh, is nothing. So. I want to see how Ineos can get that up to say around 180 liters and even that is not class leading by any means. In my Land Cruiser I carry 260 liters on board just in tanks plus whatever I have in Jerry's. One yet unanswered question is really the reliability, serviceability and parts availability. Overall, to be honest, I'm not too concerned there. I think the parts which Ineos chose are all well proven and really should stand up to what they are designed for. In regards to service centers and serviceability, I think the plan Ineos has with uh, linking up with established service centers all over Australia and then also have a few specialists, I think that is great. And I'm looking forward how that will pan out. Ineos will also provide you a full service manual. That means if you are in the bush, you can actually repair the car yourself possibly, or the local mechanic who may not know the car has access to the full service manual. And I think that is awesome. But the proof will be in the pudding once that is all implemented and up and running. So my final conclusion, have I bought uh, Ineos Grenadier? Have I put a deposit down? No, I have not. Could I see me driving one at some stage? Yes, I definitely can, if these three main issues have a satisfactory solution. Keep in mind, no four-wheel drive is perfect. No matter what you buy, you always will have to make sacrifices. But there are certain things which are very hard to sacrifice. And for example, that is fuel range, that is suspension, which is one of the most important parts in my book for any four-wheel drive. Before I go, I just wanted to say one last thing. I do focus a little more on the shortcomings in this video, simply because I have not seen them addressed sufficiently anywhere else. However, I do give Ineos a lot of credit. When other manufacturers like Land Rover, Toyota or Nissan move to produce luxury SUVs with some off-road capabilities, 
Ineos went against the grain and developed a purpose-built four-wheel drive. I further admire that Ineos is brave enough to present an early prototype to the masses and open it up for critique. Let's keep in mind this is a prototype and I hope Ineos can address some of the issues mentioned and find solutions for them. I honestly wish that Ineos succeeds. So I hope you enjoyed my perspective of the Ineos Grenadier. Please don't forget to like, share, subscribe and keep in mind this channel is a hobby of mine. It is completely self-funded. So if you like what I do, maybe consider helping me with the equivalent of a cup of coffee or two and head over to Patreon or buy me a coffee and support me there. Thank you very much and I hope to see you along the tracks.